Hello kids, I'm Bill Nye the Science Guy, and welcome to my basement of science. Bill Nye, what are you talking about? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm not Bill Nye, but he couldn't attend the show today, so he's asked us to fill in. Let's do it. Have you ever wondered how your body repairs itself and grows? Uh, no. Well, too bad. I'm still gonna tell you. Anyway, well, your body grows and repairs through the process of... <laughs> cell division. Say what? <laughs> That's right, Bill Nine. Your cells divide, and new cells replace old cells when you grow. That's how it grows, right? But in order for this to happen, your DNA must also be divided. So, what's DNA, you may ask? So, DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It's, it's basically the, uh, the instructions for everything about you and how you're made up. So, why is DNA important? DNA? Is that even a question? DNA acts as a code. It codes for every single part of your body. How you're made up, what you look like, how you look like, and it's in every single cell of your body. Without it, you don't exist. So your cells, your DNA all needs to divide or you can't exist! <laughs> well, what now? Well, today we're going to learn about DNA replication. Yay! I'm learning about DNA replication! Woo! <laughs> Before we move on to DNA replication, let's recap about what we talked about in our last episode. In our last episode, we talked about how DNA is located in the nucleus of your cell. So if this was a nucleus, the DNA would be in the form of chromosomes inside the cell, inside the nucleus. So let's say your DNA looked like this. As we already know, your DNA is like a double helix. It winds like that. Like that, yeah. So your DNA wraps around nucleosomes. So it's around 200 base pairs per 8 nucleosomes. And they continuously coil to make a super coil. And eventually coil up to make a super, super coil called the chromosomes. And that's how your DNA is mapped inside the nucleus. So the human sex cell has 23 chromosomes and the, a normal human cell has 23 pairs of chromosomes and all cells can give rise to a new generation via the cell cycle. DNA is replicated in the S phase of interphase. The replicated DNA in the nucleus is then divided equally between two daughter cells during mitosis. The cell is then split into two daughter cells in by cytokinesis. Each daughter cell thus has an exact copy of the parent cell's DNA. So let's say this was the cell cycle of life. So from this starting point, all the way around to here, I would say, is the interphase. So within the interphase, we have our G1 phase, our S phase, and our G2 phase. And just this tiny part right here is our mitotic phase in which the cell actually divides. We're focusing on the S phase up here. This is where the DNA replicates itself. So, step one for DNA replication. A portion of the double helix is unwound by DNA helicase. It breaks the hydrogen bonds between the complementary base pairs, holding the two DNA strands together, resulting in unzipped helix that terminates a replication form. So we have the DNA strand here, so let's just model this, the nine steps of DNA replication. So let's say this is my uh, original strand. It's ready to replicate because it's in the S phase. So my DNA helicase right here, it's coming. He's coming. He's an enzyme. He's coming. And he works, works on the DNA strand. So what he's doing, he's unwinding this DNA until you get two separate strands. He's going to continue unwinding because, you know, DNA is a double helix. So we want just one strand. So the enzyme helicase acts as an unzipper. Unzipper? You guys know how unzippers work? If I unzip this, that's helicase for you. Unzipper. So it unzips the DNA until we get two strands that terminate at a replication fork, just like so. See these forks? My replication fork right here. Yeah, it's been on for like hours. Step two, 
the two individual strands are kept apart by single-stranded binding proteins, SSPs. They bind to the exposed DNA single strands and block further hydrogen bonding. Good. So now that our helicase has gone to work and we have our two individual strands being a replication fork right here, we have these proteins called the single-stranded binding proteins that my friend already discussed about. These proteins, called SSBs, are placed at these places right here, one here and one here. What they do is, they keep the replication fork separated to stop any extra hydrogen bonding to bring these forks together. Because if these forks come back together, new strands can't be created, so they must be kept separate, like, just like so, by the SSBs. That's why they're important. Action. DNA gyrase relieves any tension brought about by the unwinding the DNA strands by cutting both strands of DNA allowing them to swivel around one another and then resealing the cut strands. Hey. So in our next step, we talked about DNA gyrase. DNA gyrase comes in and what it does, it relieves the strands. It relieves the tension in the strands so they don't snap. And it allows them to swivel around each other just like so. So there's no tension while the replication occurs. That's what DNA gyrase is all about. DNA is oriented in a really interesting way. We have two ends, known as the 5 prime end and the 3 prime end. When the two parent strands are separated, they become anti-parallel. What this means is one is oriented 5 prime to 3 prime, while the other is oriented 3 prime to 5 prime. DNA polymerase 3 can only add nucleotides in the 5 prime to the 3 prime direction. This means that it needs an, a, a free 3 prime end to start off at so that it can go in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. That is, because 5 is complementary to 3, and 3 is complementary to 5. So this is what it means by anti-parallel. Step 4. The enzyme primase lays down RNA primers that will be used by DNA polymerase 3 as a starting point to build the new complementary strands. Cut. Okay. Yeah, we're going to have like so much videos. like. So these two strands are anti-parallel. So that means they're oriented differently. So, to replicate these two strands, they must be done in a different way. The first strand, which is the 3' prime to 5' prime strand, can be easily duplicate, replicated through the process of the RNA polymerase 1 because it can easily move from the 3' prime to 5' prime end and can move towards replication fork. This is called the leading strand. In step 4, we have RNA primases working, and these work on the lagging strand. What these, fork, what these enzymes do, they set up these places in which 10 nucleotides are present to set up a free 3' prime end for RNA polymerase to work on. And these, and the, the RNA, oh, fuck, should I do it again? Step 5. DNA polymerase 3 starts an RNA primer and moves along the template strand in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction, adding the appropriate DNA nucleotides in the 3' prime end of the new strand as it goes along. The new strand grows in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction. Step 6. The leading strand is built continuously towards the replication fork. A lagging strand, composed of short segments of DNA, also known as Okazaki fragments, is built discontinuously away from the replication fork. 1. RNA primase lays these uh, primer, RNA primers on the lagging strand so that they set up 10 nucleotides on the strand complementary to what was already there. The DNA polymerase 3 recognizes these primers and works away from, the, away from the replication fork. These fragments that these RNA primers make are called Okazaki fragments. So, to recap, the leading strand is, is when the R DNA polymerase 3 works towards the replication fork. The lagging strand is where the primers are existent and the DNA polymerase 3 works away from the uh, replication fork. Step 7. DNA polymerase 1 removes RNA primers and replaces them with the appropriate DNA nucleotides. After this, occur after this occurs, DNA polymerase 1 comes in and removes the primers. So let's say my hand was DNA polymerase 1. What it's going to do is it's going to take the RNA primase and take it away and fill it with the appropriate nucleotides. Step 8. DNA ligase joins the gaps in the Okazaki fragments by the creation of phosphodiester bonds. 
after the RNA primers leave, we're left with these broken up fragments of DNA because of the Okazaki fragments. That's where the DNA ligase comes in. Ooh. So what it does is it acts as a glue to reform the phosphodiester bonds between the Okazaki fragments so we get a continuous strand of DNA. Step 9. As complementary strands are built, DNA polymerase 1 and DNA polymerase 3 proofread the newly synthesized strand. When mistakes occur, either enzyme backtracks past the nucleotides on the end of the strands as, as it is incorrectly paired to a nucleotide on the template, removes it, and continues adding new nucleotides to the complementary strand. So as the DNA is being replicated, DNA polymerase 1 and 3 go through the DNA strands and proofread them to make sure that there are no mistakes in the base pair sequences. In times of need, when, mis when corrections need to be made, they will add or remove the uh, necessary base pairs so that the DNA has been proofread and is fully functional with no mistakes in them. As the nucleotides are being added and DNA polymerase 1 and 3 are at work, they also work as exonucleases to proofread the DNA strands. So what's happening is, the DNA polymerase 1 and 3 can go through the strand as nucleotides are being added to proofread it. And whenever the mistakes occur, they can act as a nucle exonuclease. An exonuclease is an enzyme that cuts out nucleotides at the end of a DNA strand. So whenever there's a single base pair an error, these can act as exonucleotides to cut those parts out and add in, re-add in new nucleotides to correct that mistake. Because if these mistakes were copied to a new strand of DNA, it could become detrimental. What? So as you've realized, we had this original strand of DNA and two new strands of DNA that are completely identical. The thing is though, we had a single strand turned to unwind two separate strands and then uh, another strand added to each one of these. So what do we realize? That every strand of DNA is semi-conservative. What that means is there is one old strand and a new strand to make a whole new strand of DNA. That's what it means by semi-conservative. This whole idea was confirmed by the experiment of Masterson and Stahl, in which DNA is composed of a new, a one old strand and a new strand.